Most people <laughs> believe that they will go to heaven when they die. And their hope is fostered by the comforting words of a lot of preachers, of priests, of rabbis. And their hope is based upon the idea that heaven is for all believers or for those whose good works outweigh their bad works in this life. But I want to ask the question here this morning, are such hopes well-founded? Are most people going to go to heaven when they die? Is salvation based upon good works? Is it based upon faith only? I want you to take a look at some of the words of Jesus, because Jesus offers to us a few ominous warnings that I, I think if more people who claim to be religious took a look at, they might, might change their views a little bit about who's going to heaven. And they're found in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way. You're, you're good. You're good. I'm good. Yeah, thank you. By the way, the slow, the slow turning of the songs was not Rhiannon's fault. The clicker, it's the clicker's fault. So, don't want to give her any blame. Actually, was it on? Did you turn it on? I just turned it on. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure it was on. Because if it's not on, it won't work. <laughs> I just, okay. All right. So... Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14, we'll start with verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Do you hear that? If you take a listen to the words of Jesus, it doesn't sound like he's saying there's going to be more people going to heaven and finding eternal life than there are going to condemnation. He actually says there's more people headed for destruction and condemnation than there are eternal life. There's only few who are going to find it. Take a look at what he says a little bit later in verse 21. It's here on your screen. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and your name cast out demons and your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. The term no in the Bible is a term that suggests relationship. In the Old Testament, when it says that Adam knew his wife, I think we understand what that means. It doesn't just flat out say Adam had sex with his wife, but that's what happened. There was a relationship. There was an intimacy that existed between Adam and his wife, and then they had a child, children. And when the term no is used often in scriptures, it suggests relationship. It suggests intimacy. And what Jesus is saying to some of these people on the judgment day is, depart from me, I never knew you. I never had an intimate close relationship with you. Or perhaps vice versa. It's not that Jesus doesn't want to have that relationship. It's that maybe we never had that relationship with him. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So with this passage in mind, you will notice that many religious people, including some believers in Jesus, will learn that they too are going to be lost. So I want to use this passage as a springboard for our study. This year we've been talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And I want to address the question, who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because clearly not everyone will. I want to review for just a minute and add a little bit of teaching to what we've already studied in our series on Sunday mornings as we think about that term kingdom in the scriptures. One of the things that we've mentioned as we've studied this is that the kingdom in scriptures is often used in the present tense. It's not just something that's far off in the future. 
For example, in Luke chapter 17, 20 and 21, Jesus says this, which we have quoted in past lessons. Verse 20, he says, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. It's not a physical kingdom, nor will they say, see here, or see there. Indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Kingdom of God is within you. So in some present sense, God is ruling as our king today, now when we accept his rule from the heavens. So the kingdom of heaven is focused in the person of Jesus Christ, and it's especially manifested when he rules in the hearts of men. The kingdom of heaven, we've noticed, it's spiritual in nature. Jesus said, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, but my kingdom is not from here. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not an earthly material kingdom where we have literal wars and battles try to pull out swords to find out who's the greatest and the strongest. It's a spiritual kingdom where instead our sword is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Our armor is taking upon ourselves the whole armor of God. Our fights are not carnal, 2 Corinthians 10 says, but instead they are spiritual in nature, pulling down strongholds, changing people's minds and thoughts about Jesus. In Romans 14, 17, it says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is not physical. It's not material. It's spiritual in nature. And when God rules our hearts, we understand how to be righteous. We understand how to have true joy. We understand how to have peace with God and peace with our fellow man in his kingdom. It began when all authority was given to Jesus. That's when the kingdom began. Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he says, all authority is mine. I'm king now. I'm declaring my kingship. So all authority is mine and all right to rule is his. He's declared as king by Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, on the day of Pentecost. Peter says that this Jesus is Lord and Christ. Christ means anointed one. It's the idea that he's the king. He's the anointed one. He's the king of the kingdom now. And he's declared as king throughout the New Testament letters and epistles. In fact, when you read Colossians 1 and verse 13, you see the term kingdom used in that present tense, as if we can be in the kingdom right now. Not something that we're waiting for. It is something that exists right now. The kingdom, the church. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. They weren't still waiting for the kingdom. These Christians in Colossae were already in the kingdom. They had left Satan's kingdom, if you will, his rule, and they had been translated into the kingdom of Jesus Christ when uh, they had obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' kingdom they had redemption and the forgiveness of sins. So the term kingdom is used very much in a present tense way in the scriptures, especially with the New Testament church. Revelation 1.9, you see it used that way just one more time. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He says, I was on the island that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was in the kingdom. So kingdom's used in a, in a present tense, but I do want to point out, because I would be remiss if I did not point out, but, but the kingdom is used in a future sense as well. And so kingdom's used in a present sense, it's used in a future sense, and I just want to notice with you a couple passages where it is used in that way, and you have to read the context to try to understand what we're talking about. Look at Matthew chapter 13. We're going to take a look at a lot of these kingdom parables later in a series, but I'm going to give you a head start by looking at verse 40 as Jesus explains the parable of the tares. He says in verse 40, As the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. So here we are living in this present age, but what's going to happen at the end? Jesus is clearly looking ahead to something future. Something that's going to happen at the end of this age. When did this age end? Well, when Jesus returns... 1 Corinthians 15 says the kingdom will be delivered to God, the Father, who has all rule and authority. At the end of this age, when this world is burnt up and we are um, all standing before the judgment seat of Christ, that's when this is going to happen. Verse 41. The Son of Man will send out His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom. 
So he does admit there is such a thing as a kingdom that exists, but they're going to gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. You're going to be pulled out of the kingdom. He says in verse 42, they will be cast into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The righteous, though, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. What's he referring to there? He's saying at the end of this age, at the judgment, there are some who are in the kingdom who are going to continue to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom of in eternity. There are some who are hypocrites in the kingdom who don't truly know the son, who don't have an intimate relationship, who aren't right with him, and they're going to be pulled out of the kingdom and they are going to be punished everlastingly. That's what Jesus teaches in Matthew 13. He's looking ahead to a future sense of the kingdom. Take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 where we see this same idea. It says in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, it says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And I said that's, just, that's what we're referring to. I think that's what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 13. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. One of the points I want to make to you, by the way, with this is that a thief doesn't tell you when he's coming. It's a surprise. It's not a good surprise either. Thief doesn't tell you. There's no warning. Now the day of the Lord, when the Lord returns, this is going to be like a thief. In other words, there's not going to be any warning. There are a lot of people, they want to look at passages like Matthew 24, and they want to pretend that Matthew 24 is about the, the end of all time. That's not what Matthew 24, the first half of that chapter, is about. It's about the destruction of Jerusalem. There is going to be, there was going to be warnings before Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. When the end of the world occurs, when Jesus returns and this earth is burnt up, there is going to be no warning signs. The day of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. And if you have questions about that, we can study it. But in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. What are we talking about here? This earth, the elements. It's very specific to mention that. They're going to be burned up. This earth is going to be destroyed. What happens at that point? Well, he says in verse 11, since all these things are going to be dissolved, all your houses, all your money, all your banks, all your clothes, all your material things, everything in this earth is going to be burnt up. Since that's going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He's encouraging them, don't put your trust in things here on this earth. You need to put your trust in the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ and be a holy, godly person preparing for that moment. He says we should be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. And nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's something that we are looking ahead to in the future. And that's one of the things that motivates us to be part of his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, if we were to make it as simple as possible, the kingdom of heaven was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost when the first gospel sermon was preached in Acts 2. It will be culminated when Jesus returns to deliver it back to God. And you read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 through 28. Take a look at it. We're going to look at a few of these verses and then we're going to get to the main text. But we want to clarify what the kingdom is and what it's referred to here in this passage. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23, it says, Each one in his own order. He's talking about being raised from the dead. Christ is the first fruits. Christ was the first one raised from the dead. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. When are we going to be raised from the dead? When Christ returns. People have the question, what happens when I die? Well, this passage gives you a pretty good idea. Okay? Um, when Jesus returns, then you are going to be raised. And then comes the end. Verse 24. What's going to happen at the end? When this earth is destroyed and all the elements are burned up, it says he will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. And he's going to put an end to all rule and all authority and all power. All the, all the rulers, all the kingdoms, all the governments, everything we know here on earth, it's gone. And now it is just the kingdom of God. We will be delivered to his kingdom in eternity. 
He must reign, though. Jesus is reigning now. He is the kingdom now till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He has put all things under his feet. When he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. What that means is God is the one who put all things under Jesus. So God is the Father, is the only one not under Jesus. When all things are made subject to Jesus, then the Son himself will be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. It's looking forward to something future. Hasn't yet happened. Well, in the passage we're looking at here, what sense is the term kingdom being used? In the present sense, or is it looking ahead to something future? Well, let's just take a look at it, and I think, I think we can figure it out pretty easy. Matthew 7, verse 21 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me, in that day. Doesn't it sound like it's looking forward to something future? Not right now. People aren't saying that to them right now. Instead, they're going to be surprised in that day at the final judgment. That's what we're talking about, the kingdom in the future sense of the word. Um, now, this isn't the only time Jesus talks about the kingdom, by the way, in the future since the word. Let me, let me notice a couple more passages. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, The Son of Man is going to come in His glory, coming of Jesus, and all the holy angels with Him, and then He will sit on the throne of His glory, and the nations will be gathered before Him. All nations, everybody. It's going to be gathered before Jesus. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand. The goats will be on his left hand. And the king, it's Jesus, will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now you get to enjoy the everlasting kingdom. That's at the judgment. So Jesus here, speaking of the kingdom in that future sense. And by the way, the standards for those who would be on the right hand are very clear here. Standards are, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and he came to me. Jesus goes on to say, those are some of the things that I expect of people in my kingdom. You care about the hungry, you care about the thirsty, you care about the sick, you care about those who have been wrongfully imprisoned, you care about those who are visitors and strangers in a foreign land, you care about those people. That's one of the standards of judgment. That's one of the ways we know we have an intimate relationship with Jesus. We care about people. We love mankind just as God loves us. Second Peter 1, the kingdom is also used in that future sense. And we'll just look at that one more passage and then we'll get into our text. Second Peter 1 and verse 10 says, Brethren, be more diligent to make your call and election sure. If you do these things, you will never stumble and an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you want to be a part of that everlasting kingdom, it says, be careful how you live your life here. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. So there's a, a kingdom in the present sense, a kingdom in the future sense. And I think the fact that Jesus says in that day indicates that he's talking about the kingdom in the future sense here. Um, what Jesus is talking about is those who will enter the kingdom in its future aspect. So let's think about who is going to enter the kingdom in that future aspect. Well, first of all, Here's what Jesus says, that not everyone's going to enter the kingdom. Not everyone. Did you notice that? Look at Matthew 7. Here's our main text. Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone. That's how it starts. Who says to me, not everyone. So, Universalism, the claim of universalism is that everybody is going to be saved. And the reason why, in fact, the proof text that's used by those who are universalists to try to argue this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 
Here's what 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 says. It says in verse 3, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Is it true that God desires everyone to be saved? Absolutely. But does that mean that everyone is going to be saved? Those two things are not, they don't equate. God can desire everyone to be saved and yet everyone not be that way. Look, I, if, if I'm a school teacher, I desire that every single person get an A plus in class. Does that mean that everyone in my class is motivated enough to work their tails off to achieve that? Some of you teachers out there, you know the answer to that. Clyde's cracking up. Clyde knows the answer to that. Right, Clyde? Just because as a teacher you want everybody to get an A+, plus, doesn't mean that everybody's going to get it. There are some things that you're going to have to do to accomplish it. There's some sacrifices that you're going to have to make. There's some trust that you're going to have to put in your teacher in order to achieve that. Not everyone. And so, though God desires all people to be saved, it doesn't mean that all will be saved. Now, there's others, they'll easily concede that, they'll say, well, of course, you know, we, we know, there are horrible sinners, you know, God certainly is not going to save people like Adolf Hitler and Stalin and mass murderers like that, you know, the Ted Bundys and stuff like that. They have a hard time comprehending. God surely, you know, people who are just impenitent rapists and um, we, we see and we conceive of those things as the horrible sins. And by the way, for every one of those sins, God could actually forgive those things. But you've got to be willing to turn and have a relationship with him and repent. But a lot of people, they can see that. They can say, you know, I get it. Not everybody's going to be in heaven. Um, so I hear that. But a lot of people have the idea that everybody's going to heaven. There, and there are a lot of preachers because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings at nearly every funeral they've ever preached. They pretend to know the eternal destination of even the most remote stranger. I was called a couple years after I moved here. I was called and I was asked to do a funeral. And the family said to me, they said, you know, we wanted you to do this funeral because um, this man... Um, I, he, he had come to your church a few times. So I asked his name, you know, apparently he had them believing that he had come here. I had never seen him or known him. I asked some of the older members. I'd only been here a couple of years at that point. And uh, have you guys ever heard of this person? Uh, never. never. Well, he said he used to come here. So I went and sat down with the family. I said, tell me, tell me what's going on. You know, um, what, he was a young man. He had four or five children, I remember. And I remember them being there at the funeral. Um, so we sat down with the family. I said, tell me, tell me what happened here. Well, he had gotten drunk and he'd gotten into a fight. He'd already been arrested several times for OWIs. He didn't have a license. He was fleeing the police. And as he was fleeing the police, he basically ran his car into a tree and he died. Okay. Um, so is there any, is, you know, we talked about the family and we talked about what he did before that, things like that. Is there anything that you want me to say? And the, the mother said, I just want you to let everybody know that he's in heaven now and everything's better. And I said, I can't do that. For one, I'm not the judge. That's not, it's not my job. It's not my job to be the judge at funerals. A lot of preachers have taken that upon themselves. It's not my job. I certainly can't guarantee that in that situation, while you're breaking the law and you are drunk, and now you've left your children as orphans, that God's pleased with that. So I just can't do that in good conscience. And everything I say and preach in the sermon, I want to make sure that I can say it in good conscience knowing that I'm going to be held accountable for what I say and what I present to others, making sure that I'm not lying or offering false hope to people. That's not my job. A lot of people think it's the job. Just, you just say whatever comforts somebody, even if it's a lie. 
It's not our job to lie as preachers. It's our job to be honest with people about the reality of life and to let them know that you don't want to be in this situation. But they had the idea that just because he had entered a church building, even though I didn't remember it or no one else did, that at some point in time he had heard a sermon, perhaps he had confessed a faith in the Lord, that everything was going to be okay. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, just because you've called out my name one time in your life or many times, not everyone who just says it, not everybody who just professes to be a follower of Jesus he says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. What's that tell us? Well, not just those who profess are going to be in heaven. So we need to realize that there's more to this relationship than just claiming to be a follower of Jesus. I don't think I have to give you a whole lot of examples to prove to you that there are a lot of people who claim to be Christian and they don't act like Christians at all. And one of the things that we need to make very clear to people is that it's more than just a title. It's a life, the lifestyle. It's a change of practice. It's a change of attitude. It's a change of heart that we have to see in your life. It's not just a title you wear. It's not just throwing a cross on a piece of jewelry that makes you a Christian. So much more to it. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. I want you to notice some other passages. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, notice verse 42. It says, among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Notice, these people who believed, but... The reason why they wouldn't confess is because, verse 43 says, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Is God pleased with the type of person who would rather be pleasing to all of their friends and all of the world than they would be pleasing to God? That's not the kind of faith that God wants. These people believe they might have known that he was Lord in their minds, but they didn't act like it. They weren't willing to confess him in front of others. There are some who teach that as long as somebody believes in Jesus, they're going to be saved. Salvation, to many people, is by faith only. That's all you have to have. Just confess your faith once, and everything's going to be okay. Even though the only time faith only is found in the Scriptures, here's what it says. It's in James 2 and verse 24. It says in that passage that it speaks of faith only. It says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. James is really agreeing with what Jesus has said in Matthew 7, 21. Not just those who call out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just those who have faith alone and their life doesn't seem to indicate their faith. Both of these things need to go together. There is such a thing, and I want you to understand this, there is such a thing as an unsaved believer. John 12 is an example of that. They believed in Jesus, but they would not confess him because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The demons are an example of that in James 2. James 2 and verse 19, the demons are well aware of who God is and the power of God. It says, even the demons believe and tremble. And James is speaking to his audience and saying, hey, you believe there's one God? Good for you. The demons do too. You need to show it by your actions. Demons believe. It doesn't mean they submit necessarily to God. There were certainly some who believed in Jesus, but they weren't saved. What's a true disciple then? What does Jesus want from us if we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, a true disciple is someone who doesn't just believe in their head and live life however they want. A true disciple needs to prove their discipleship by being both a learner and a doer of what Jesus says. Look at John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spoke this word, these words, many believed in him. That's great. 
Jesus catches on to that. He knows that people are believing in his teachings, believing he's the son of God. They're seeing his miracles. They're impressed with what he's teaching them. And so he's got believers. And then he expresses to them, it's very important for you to understand that it's not just believing in me that's enough. Verse 31, it says, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide, notice the if, that's a condition. It suggests that belief alone is not enough. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Jesus doesn't just want us to be disciples in word. He wants us to be disciples indeed. You know, one of the things that Jesus said to Nathaniel, when Nathaniel first came to him, he says, you know, behold, here is an Israelite indeed. In other words, he saw something in Nathaniel that Jesus often didn't see from a lot of the other rulers in Israel. A lot of the other rulers in Israel, they claim to be followers of Moses and followers of, in the nation of Israel. And yet by their, by their lives and by their, ac- by their actions, they weren't acting like it. He says to Nathaniel though, he says, I can tell by your life because I know you. I can tell that you're an Israelite, not just in word, but also in deed. And I think that's why he called Nathaniel to be his apostle, to be his disciple. Because he needed someone sincere and genuine to be spreading his message to others. And that's who Jesus wants as his true disciples now. People abiding in his word so we can be true disciples and people who know the truth so the truth can make them free. So it's not just those who profess. The third thing though, in that day, when it comes our time, as we prepare to enter into the kingdom, in that day, it's not just going to be a good person either who's saved. Look at what some of these people respond with in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. Matthew 7 and verse 22. And I think we can illustrate this, right? Last night, I, I came downstairs, was upstairs. I think I took a nap yesterday. Yes, I did. That's a rare, it's a rare thing, but it was, a, it was wonderful. Um, took a nap yesterday. Come downstairs. The kids were downstairs. They're watching Princess and the Frog or something. Zoe got hungry. Zoe, their instructions actually before I took that little nap, and earlier were to clean the kitchen. Clean the kitchen. We had a big day. Want the kitchen spotless, want the floor swept, want the dishes in the sink. You know, we just need you to do that. And they'd done that before I napped off. Come downstairs, Zoe. She's got Chex Mix boxes all over the table. She's got peanut butter out. She has granulated sugar instead of confectioner sugar. And she, she has chocolate. She has melted down chocolate in the oven and has a saucepan full of chocolate. And she is putting together puppy chow. She's making puppy chow. I'm impressed that a 10-year-old can do all of these things. Sometimes she impresses me. And come down, though, and kind of say, "Ah, I remember something about a clean kitchen. Who is going to clean up all of these saucepans and peanut butter and all these things? Well, Dad, I made puppy chow. Aren't you impressed? Um, no, I'm not impressed because you're using granulated sugar instead of powdered sugar, so you made it wrong. So what did she do? She just added, added the same amount of gr- powdered sugar. <laughs> so that's some very sugary puppy chow she made. But the point is this. The point is this. You come down and you say to your children sometimes, uh, didn't I say I wanted a clean kitchen? And they say, but, but hold on. This is a good thing that I'm doing here. So, no, no, no. A good thing would be that I walk downstairs and I don't have to clean up a dirty kitchen again. That would be the good thing. Now, this is the idea here. Jesus says, now here's, here's how I want you to live your life. Here's everything that I want you to do. He declares to people, hey, you didn't do what I want to do. And they say, now hold on, Jesus. Verse 22 says, haven't we prophesied in your name though? I mean, we were religious. Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done many wonders in your name? Can't you see a lot of the good stuff that we've done? And Jesus still says, 
I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, what was wrong with some of these good things? I never commanded it, I think is the idea. Christ has a law. Christ has rules. Christ has a way that he wants you to live. And the fact that you can find alternative things to do that you may in your mind think are good, if you're not doing what he says, then Christ is not pleased. Not just being good. Now, such good works can't obviously earn our way into heaven. I want to give you an example of that. Take a look at Acts chapter 10 and consider Cornelius. Consider Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10, if there was ever a good guy, it's Cornelius. He's a good guy. Take a look about him. Acts 10 verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He's a military man. Centurion was a leader over a uh, hundred people, so he was a trusted military leader. He was a devout man. You can be a military man and be a devout man. He was a military man and a devout man. He was one who feared God with all his household. So he's leading his family to have a God-fearing attitude. And we can respect that. He gave alms generously to the people. He's a giving man. He helps people out. He's charitable. He prayed to God always. He's a praying man. About the ninth hour of the day, though, he sees clearly a vision, an angel of God coming in, saying to him, Cornelius, when he observed him, he was afraid. He said, what is it, Lord? He said, your prayers, your alms, they've come up for a memorial before God. In other words, God does notice Cornelius. I've noticed you. You're a good guy. He says, send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now, a lot of people, if they were to preach the funeral of Cornelius, what they would say is, this guy was a giving guy. This guy was... He prayed. This guy had a good family. This guy was served our country. Surely he's in heaven. But I want you to see something about Cornelius, and that is that Cornelius wasn't saved. In Acts chapter 11, notice verse 14, because this is actually the retelling of the conversion of Cornelius. See, Cornelius was the first Gentile family to be converted in the new kingdom. They started with the Jews. Then they brought the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter, in Acts 10, converts Cornelius to be a believer in Jesus. In Acts 11, he retells the story to others so that they can start teaching Gentile people. And to Acts chapter 11 and verse 14, as he retells it, he says, He told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Why? Why do you need to call for Simon Peter? This is a good guy. If he's already headed to heaven, why does he need to call the apostle Peter? Verse 14 gives you the answer. Because Peter is going to tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Because God wants you to be saved. And right now you're not. You see, Cornelius hadn't yet heard about Jesus. He hadn't yet submitted himself to Jesus by turning from his sins as good as he was. He had sin in his past by being baptized into Jesus Christ to start his new life and his new journey. And indeed, he was baptized. If you read Acts 10, 47, it says that he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. So he's baptized. He hadn't yet obeyed Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ requires of those who will be saved. What does this passage teach us? This passage teaches us that Merely being good or religious is not the standard. Cornelius was religious and he was good, and yet he was not yet saved. He was after he did what Peter told him, the apostle, but not before. That's why he needed to hear words. That's why you need to hear the preaching of the gospel. Turn back to Matthew chapter 7, and I want you to notice the broader context of Matthew 7. Jesus says in verse 22, all these people are going to say to him, Lord, haven't we done this and haven't we done that? What was Jesus just warning about before he gets to this text in this big sermon that he's preaching here? We're in verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets. He says, you need to realize there's such a thing as false teaching. There's such a thing as people who are going to tell you that everything is okay with your life and that you're saved, but you need to check and make sure that it's consistent with Jesus' teaching. 
Beware of false prophets, he says. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. It's sad to think that there might be wolves in the church. But there are. Jesus tells us there are. And he's the one that warns us about it. We've got to be on our guard. We've got to make sure that we're checking up on what people are teaching us with God's word, the standard. In verse 16, it says, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes, figs from thistles? Every good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit. A bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit, it's cut down. It's thrown into the fire. By their fruits, you will know them. Then he goes on to this sermon and says, here's what you need to know. And that is you need to be careful that you're not being led astray and that you're being led into a true intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, not with some church, not with some religion, not with some tradition, not with some teaching that's been handed down by men, a relationship with Jesus Christ and his church and his kingdom where he's ruling your life. That's what you need to be led into. If you're going to be that person who hears the words, enter into the joys of my kingdom, good and faithful servant. It's not everybody who's going to enter in heaven it's not just those who profess, and it's not just those who may be good people. Those who act without authority, and those who are not truly doing works by the power and authority of Jesus Christ, may be lost. So who will enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, let's finish up with a happy thought, a positive thought, so that you can know that it isn't a hopeless thing for people. Here's who's going to enter. Matthew 7, verse 21. Jesus is very clear about it. Those who do the will of my Father in heaven. The will. Some of you, you may have experienced this where someone in your family has died. One of the things that you should do, and I hope that most of you have done this, and that is you need to write out a last will and testament for your children's sake and for your family's sake so that after you're gone they know what to do with your belongings and they're not fighting over it. Because if you make it very clear in your last will and testament to your children and to your family, this is what I want done with my money and with my things, with my inheritance, it makes it very easy for that will to be executed, to be carried out. Well, God has a will for us. He has a will and when Jesus died and was resurrected, he was the testator of that will. And we are to live by that will. We're to be carrying out that will. How do I know what the will is? Well, the will's been written down. Last will and testament right here of Jesus Christ. It's found in his gospels. It's found in the book of Acts. It's found in the writings of his apostles. You want to know how he wanted life on earth to be carried out after he ascended up into heaven? This is where you find it. This is his last will and testament. You want to do the will of the Father in heaven? You've got to be very acquainted with these writings, these inspired writings that are from God, so you know how to live out your life, so that you know I'm doing the will of my Father in heaven. It's not going to be found in the teachings of, of necessarily men. It's not going to be found in your local bookstore, maybe. It's found in this set of books that are inspired of God. That's how you know you're doing His will. Now, this suggests, when it says those who do the will of my Father in heaven, it suggests that we be both hearers and doers of the word. So I want to tell you that don't go to the judgment day and say to Jesus, well, Jesus, I sat in church every Sunday. I, I, I was there, unless I was sick, I was always there. I sat in that church building. It's not just sitting in a church building. Sitting in a church building doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into a Burger King makes you a Big Mac. I guess it'd be a Whopper in Burger King. <laughs> I thought that was pretty witty until I realized I was an idiot. You get it. You've got to be a hearer and a doer of the word. There are a lot of people sitting in church buildings that are flat out hypocrites. If that's you, you're not going to heaven. Jesus says so. You can't be just listening to his word and not living it in your life and be acceptable with God. <coughs> James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. 
Verse 22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If you think because you walked into a church building and you listened to Moody Radio somewhere, or, or you got dipped in some water at some point in time, that that's going to make it okay with you and, and God. You went to a Christian university because you were raised by Christian parents. None of that stuff are going to be the standards of judgment on the judgment day. Here it is. Here's the standard judgment. Being a hearer and a doer of the word. Living it out. If you just listen to it and you don't live it, he says you're deceiving yourself. You're tricking yourself. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself. He goes away and he forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it. He's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one, this one will be blessed in what he does. You want to be blessed eternally? Listen to the words of our Father, the words of the Spirit, the words of Jesus, the words of his apostles, given to us by inspiration, and live it in your life. And then you're going to be blessed. This suggests we be hearers and doers. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 7, right? He says, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house. And it stood because it was founded on the rock. But anyone who's like a foolish man, he builds his house on the sand. And the rains descend, the floods come, the winds blow, beat on that house, and great was its fall. Why? Because he heard the words of Jesus and didn't live by them. You've got to build your house on the rock if you want to enter the kingdom, if you want your spiritual house to stand. God's grace and man's obedience work hand in hand. Now, I do want to say this. Some people will say, well, you're saying that we've got to do something to be saved. You've got to live a certain way. That sounds very legalistic, some people might say. I want to suggest to you that legalism is salvation by perfect law keeping. And I'm going to tell you that nobody can keep the law perfectly. Jesus is the one person who's done it. That's why he's our perfect sacrifice. Nobody has kept the law perfectly. You can't earn salvation on the merit of what you have done. Salvation by grace, though does not preclude the necessity of obedience. We need to recognize that our obedience, though, doesn't earn or merit salvation. When all is said and done, we are still going to be unworthy. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. Jesus actually makes this point. He says in verse 10, He says, uh, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust. Also. I'm in chapter 16. That's why it makes no sense. Luke 17 and verse 10. Likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. We are unprofitable servants. The Father's will, while it offers salvation by grace, it does require obedience. Go back to a couple passages we looked at last week, and we'll close with these. Romans 6, verse 17 speaks about God's grace being offered to the brethren at Rome. It says, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. These people had to do something in order to receive God's grace. They still don't earn it. We still don't deserve it. We've still sinned in our past. We don't deserve to be saved. It's only through God's grace and mercy that we receive it, but that doesn't mean there's anything for us to do on our, on our part. God has done His part, and God expects us to play a part in salvation as well. He expects us to obey. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, when the Hebrew writer writes of this, he says in verse 9, he says, Though he was a son... Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Having been perfected, that's Jesus who's been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? To all who obey him. You should underline that in your Bibles. Jesus offers salvation to all who obey him. You do have to do something. Doesn't mean you earn it. 
It just means you've met the conditions that Jesus, the author of eternal salvation, have laid out. Christ is going to come in judgment against those who don't obey the gospel. So who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, not those who profess to believe but don't obey. Not those who think that they're doing a lot of religious things but without authority. Only those who do the Father's will. And this is why we need to take an earlier statement in Jesus' sermon so seriously. Jesus said earlier, this is the theme this year for us. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Why is that important? Because if you don't, you may be one of those that Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does my will. You didn't seek first my kingdom. You may have claimed it. You may have said it. But you didn't do it. Your actions didn't prove it. We need to make the finding of God's will and His rule the number one priority in our life. That's why we're told in Scripture, Paul once said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Think about it. Is there something that I'm doing in my life that Jesus commands me not to do? Or are there things that I should be doing in my life Jesus tells me to do that I'm leaving undone, refusing to do? Examine yourself. Consider whether you are truly in the faith, whether you truly have that intimate relationship with Jesus that he calls you to have. My, um, my alma mater, Pike High School, some of you may have seen a couple weeks ago, the girls' basketball team got into a big fight with um, Ben Davis. And they were a ranked team. You know, Pike was a ranked team. They were a good team. But they lost their tempers. They got into a brawl. And now their season's over. The IHSA said, you guys are done. You're not playing another game this season. You're not playing the tournament, which I think is good. There needs to be consequences. Or else that kind of stuff's just going to keep on happening. But what a disappointment. Now, they, they, they mentioned there was a senior on that team. She wasn't involved in the fight. She walked away and went to a corner. And um, that's how our season ended. Great player. Wasn't involved in any of that mess, but because her team was, let her down. I wonder how many people are living life, trying hard to be good, thinking because they're religious and spiritual in their own way that that's okay. And they think to themselves that, um, you know, maybe we're not following Jesus all the way. Maybe we're fudging here and there and kind of letting some things slip. But we're good people. We go to church every week. We pray every day. Friends, take the Father's will seriously. If Jesus is trying to say anything to you, it's that. Take my will seriously. It needs to be followed if you want to enjoy His inheritance He's laid up for you. And the Son begs you to take it seriously. If you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, that's what Jesus commands. If you're serious about it right now, right here, then why not come forward? Why not make the confession that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized now and start off that journey, that spiritual journey, submitting to what the Lord has planned for you in your life. If you're serious about it, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, then don't delay. Act with a sense of urgency and come be a part of His kingdom and His family. Why don't you come while we stand and while we stand?